Well, hello, stranger. Today, I'm going to be doing something really insane and totally out of character for me, talking about Speak Now Taylor's version. In fact, what I'm going to be doing is ranking all of the re-recordings based on my historical allegiance to each of these songs, but also my interpretation of the new re-recordings, giving you my unfiltered, honest opinions on the vaults, which you may have had a glimpse of in my reaction video, and reshuffling the entire track list into a cohesive story that makes sense to me. You may be familiar with this series if you've been to my channel before. I have a lot of videos where I rank and reshuffle all of my favorite Taylor Swift records to try and make what is often a, shall we say, nonsensical track list seem a little bit more cohesive, something that is more pleasurable and easy to listen to going along. And, you know, part, part and parcel of doing that is there are some casualties along the way. Some of your favorites get cut, and I rank some of your favorites in the ranking portion of this video in places that you might not like to see them. And I would just like to, you know, issue the reminder that I'm having to issue in all of my videos now, which is that if I say something that you don't like, like, that's okay. The world goes on, bombs don't drop, buildings don't explode, countries don't cease to exist. If you feel the need to harass someone about their opinions on a Taylor Swift song, might I suggest you do that out of my comment section, because I have very little patience for it. But otherwise, I am so excited to be here. So welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. My name is Zach, I am the Swiftologist. And on this channel, I make thoughtful weekly videos about pop culture. And every time I say that in the videos lately, I'm like thoughtful pop culture. And yet the last like two months has just been Taylor Swift all the time. And that's because she's been doing a lot. And I've been on a world tour, I've been on a vacation. But as you can see, I am back at the Barbie dream house. I'm here in my set, I'm back in Singapore, I'm in my home environment. I'm able to, you know, sit down and put some thoughtful videos together again. Again. And let me tell you, what I have coming up for you is going to be very exciting. The Lanaologists, I know I put you guys on ice ever since, you know, Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard came out, but I just saw Lana Del Rey in Hyde Park, which was a sensational experience, might I just say. And I got to meet a couple of you, come my subscribers, which was awesome and incredible. And I am planning a Norman fucking Rockwell video. And another video that I'm working on is ranking all of the Taylor Swift re-recordings and deciding which ones I like better and which ones, you know, I will not be replacing. So, and before we go any further, I have to say, if you like these discussions about Speak Now, The Evolution of a Snake, my Taylor Swift podcast that I co-host with one of my best friends, Madeline, has just put out a new episode called Speak Now, Taylor's Misunderstood Version, where we go through in depth our thoughts on all the re-recordings, the vault tracks, and then also we go through the critical response and reception and reaction to Speak Now, which I'm going to touch on in this video too. The re-recordings project at large has largely been kind of misunderstood by professional music critics, and we definitely take aim at them in this episode. It's free to listen to wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple Music, and if if you want extra Evolution of a Snake content, then you simply must go to patreon.com slash Swiftologist, where you can get up to 12 bonus episodes a month. It's the best deal on the internet. I keep saying this, and I'm going to keep saying it because it is. So I'm going to give my overarching thoughts on Speak Now, now that the dust has settled a little bit and I've had time to listen to the record a little bit more. Something that has really made such a difference has been adjusting my Spotify playback settings because a couple of the songs sounded really kind of botched to me or incomplete production-wise when I first listened to them. And someone else can leave a comment down below and I'll pin it that explains it exactly what you need to do, but you need to turn off a couple of settings. It's like audio normalization and auto mix, and then you get to hear the full richness of the production. And something that I really loved about Speak Now Taylor's version is that it felt faithful and true to the original production of the actual record that it was mimicking instead of being something that was like a later reinterpretation. So I would say kind of in rankings of how close they are to the original, I would put Speak Now at number one. I would probably put Fearless at number two and my favorite album, Red, at number three. Red, strangely, was kind of a hack job. And I think that maybe that was because there were so many different production styles and elements that had to be contended with in that re-recording. It was also such a long, sprawling album that there was many moving parts going on. And the kind of hero product of the Red re-recording uh, album release was the All Too Well 10 minute version. And in my my opinion, the production work on that was completely botched as well. So I am definitely against Jack Antonoff being involved on any of the standard edition tracks of any of the re-recording projects. It needs to be Christopher Rowe, specifically when we're going through the nostalgic like country pop eras. I think maybe that can change a little bit, obviously, when we get into the songs he actually produced in the first place, like Reputation in 1989. But even when Jack is involved on the vault tracks, I feel like he kind of misinterprets the assignment or takes it and makes it a Jack Antonoff version of what an old Taylor Swift song should sound like. And I'm definitely kind of a canonical religious purist when it comes to this project. Like I basically want to hear these vault tracks 
essentially in their demo form, which is why I'm also kind of not super enthused about having features on the Vault Tracks either. I like to just have this time capsule, this message in a bottle from years and years ago. And certain songs really, you know, are done or reproduced in such a way that gives me that nostalgic feeling that feels like I am receiving a message from the grave, from someone that is no longer here, the old Taylor who cannot come to the phone right now. But some of them, I feel, get a little bungled in the hands of these producers who try to uh, get freaky with it. And I'm not about that. I'm not about that life. Again, I said I'm a purist and you're going to see that as I go through my rankings. But overall and in general, I think that Speak Now is a really faithful, true reproduction of that record. There are some notable improvements. There are some notable just okays. And there are some embarrassments. There are some flops. And, you know, the better than revenge lyric. I mean, I suppose we'll get into that when I talk through the song specifically, but I have strong feelings about that. Me and my co-host Madeline disagree, I think, quite fundamentally on whether or not it's okay for her to be changing lyrics on the re-recordings, specifically as it pertains to this song. But, you know, different opinions make the world go round. And that's something that I keep trying to impart to everyone, um, but I keep getting whacked in the face for, for, you know, just expressing an opinion that's not, I will only listen to Taylor's re-recorded versions and I will disregard the stolen versions ever. So I guess I have to reintroduce my party line on this topic again, which is that if Taylor fumbles a re-recording or messes something up, I still have the stolen version that I'm still going to stream. This re-recordings project is monumental, not because of the fact that they completely replace the original recordings. They are meant to devalue the masters. They are not meant to replace them entirely. Taylor herself has acknowledged that it's a choice whether you want to replace the old ones with the new versions or not. And to me, the way that I look at the re-recordings is they are separate albums to the albums that I grew up with and know and loved. I will never stop streaming the songs or the soundtrack to my adolescence, to my adulthood, to my childhood. Those simply are not going to go away and I'm not going to give up the convenience of listening to them on streaming just because there is a new version to listen to and some random 12 year old on TikTok is trying to scream at me and tell me that I have to. Um, sorry, I don't do what you tell me to do and I will not be doing that. I will, however, enjoy the re-recordings as trip down memory lane. I love going through, if you've seen any of my reaction videos, you know this, and dissecting which ones were successful reproductions, which ones were kind of just okay, which ones were a little bit flop. It's really like a Where's Waldo spot the difference game. And truly, we're so blessed to be experiencing the re-release of these records that mean so much to us twice. So I think there really shouldn't be any squabbling or complaining going on to begin with. And if I complain or, you know, give out in this video, I am just doing it in jest. At the end of the day, please know that I am extremely grateful for the food that I have received always. And before I, you know, really get into my ranking, we have to do our prayer. I have been getting some comments lately that the prayer has not been included in enough videos. And I'm very sorry because the prayer is important and it is essential. So I ask that whatever you're doing, you stop it now so that we can do something very important, which is pray for the downfall and destruction of the men who have wronged Taylor Swift. Dear Lord, we wish Scooter Braun and Scott Borchetta and John Mayer, even though Taylor pretends that she doesn't want us to wish harm upon him, but here I am. Uh, we wish not serious harm because we're not insane. We wish minor inconveniences, terrible days, and just, you know, lives of frustration and annoyance for all of these men who have made the stupid mistake of initiating a tidal wave of te voodoo against them. Um, and every tongue that rises against Taylor Swift shall fall, as we all know. Amen. All right, so here are the categories that I am using to rank all of the Taylor's versions today. And the first one is the Tell Me Why treatment. Now, there are certain songs that get inexplicably glown up. They're not usually the songs that you would expect to get a complete and total upgrade, but somehow by the grace of God, they have been upgraded to legendary status. Um, so any re-recording or song that surpasses its original treatment goes here. Great Gown. Great Gown is just, you know, it's a great song. It's, a, it's an amazing song. TV or not, this is an incredible song. I love it. I'm glad to hear it. The 15 treatment is something that is so close to the original that it's kind of indistinguishable. It was neither made better nor worse by being a Taylor's version. I like the beat. <laughs> this is probably a category some of you are familiar with. Now, this is going to be for the songs that, um, you know, just have never really been my favorite songs in the entire world or are no longer my favorite songs in the entire world. I've been on a journey with Speak Now. I've been living with this album for what, over 10 years, 13 years. So I've had a moment with each and every song on this record. And sometimes as you get older, songs become less relevant to you. Taylor's version sucks or it sucks in general. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory and should have stayed in the vault should have stayed in the vault. Now this is gonna get pretty spicy, I think. And not everything that gets ranked in a favorable position or an unfavorable position is safe from being reshuffled onto my version of the Speak Now track list. So just keep that in mind as we go along. I'm gonna keep you on your toes. So let's start with mine. I mean, 
tell me why treatment. Mine was one of those songs that I was so scared was going to get bungled because I felt like the production elements of it were quite intricate. It was really live instrument focused. And you know, with the new recording technology, sometimes that live instrument focus can be really disconcerting or like take you out of the song almost. But I felt like mine was unbelievably faithful. I was a little bit worried when I heard that seven second snippet on her Instagram where the mine just sounded very, I guess, like programmed into the song. But I think my main critique with a lot of the re-recordings is that they sound choppy or like processed together, like separate vocal takes that are just put together. There are maybe like one or two little moments where I felt like that in mine. But overall, I felt that this was a really faithful reproduction and this song goes so fucking hard and having the instrumentation in HD, in crystal clarity, oh girly. Oh, girly, it was a moment. It was a moment that I was most grateful to have been there to receive and see. Sparks Fly. Sparks Fly has been getting a lot of flack. That was one that I noticed people were really upset about and something that people commented on very freely on my reaction video. People were not happy with the way that Sparks Fly was done. And I have to say, when I listen to Sparks Fly, I go for the Speak Now tour version. Just because it goes harder, I love the arrangement. It's so rare for me to find like a live version of a Taylor Swift song that I like more than the recording. And this is one of them. It just has way more oomph and it's way more bombastic. But I think that, you know, we have the slim to no chance of Speak Now World Tour being re-recorded uh, for obvious reasons. So I'm going to put Sparks Fly in I Like the Beat because there are definitely noticeable differences. Once I made those headphone changes that I mentioned earlier and listened to it again, and I've been listening to it over and over, it does sound notably different. Let's keep in mind that Sparks Fly was also a song that was written like in the debut era. So it really, it has a young, young Taylor to live up to. And you know, at 33 years old, this lady is not catapulting herself back into her 16, 17 year old self's voice. It's just not possible. We shouldn't expect that of her. Back to December. Now, I want to put it in the 15 treatment. I could put it in the great gown, beautiful gown section for the last minute and a half or so in general, but that's just because I get hoodwinked by hearing the new vocals sing the ad libs and the outros. I would put it in the 15 treatment, but there is the glitch. There's the glitch. I keep mentioning it, and it's not the glitch from Midnight's that I love. You know, I think there's been a glitch. It is a glitch that sounds like a production error, and it just blows my mind <laughs> that when you're doing a project of this caliber and this scale for an artist of this nature, that you as a producer can let what sounds like a technical error simply pass by. And Back to December is not a song that is like Girl at Home. I think Taylor thought that she could get away with doing the girl at home treatment, um, but she couldn't with Back to December because it was a single. And people actually love this song. So I'm putting Back to December in I Like the Beat because the re-recording of it, not that good. Where would I put it if it was just being ranked normally? I would put it in Great Gown. Of course I would. It's an amazing song. Speak now the song, Tell Me Why treatment. Actually, I should really call that the Hey Steven treatment rather than the Tell Me Why treatment. Let me just update that because I think that it's a little bit more telling of what that actually means. The Hey Steven treatment is, Hey Steven is a silly song, okay? It is a silly, dumb, <laughs> little ditty written by a teenage girl. It is very of its time and of its era. And it's one of those songs that I expected a re-recording to sound ridiculous or would sound so different that it would completely put me off of the song. But the advent of Taylor being older and more mature and looking back on it with this kind of like knowing wink and this sardonic wry sense of humor makes it just so much more fun. I really felt that from Speak Now, specifically when we got to the chuckle in the last chorus and bridge. So Speak Now, usually you would be in I Like the Beat at best, okay? At, at best. And on this re-recording, she's in the Hey Steven treatment. This just shows you the power of the Taylor's versions, what they can and can't do for a song. Dear John, I'm going to put this in Great Gown. And I have mentioned this in my reaction video, I'm pretty sure. I think that Dear John, you know, you can't strike lightning in a bottle twice. It can only happen once. Dear John is one of those songs that is so propelled by its circumstance, its narrator, where the narrator was at that moment in her life. You can hear the heartbreak, the desolation, the despair all over that track. She really left everything on the table with that song the first go around. So to me, it was never going to be a candidate for the Hey Steven treatment because there's nothing you can do to the original to make it better, I suppose. There was no room for improvement. It was perfect the first go around. And the way that it mimics kind of a John Mayer song in and of itself is really, it's a masterpiece. You can't build the Taj Mahal right next to the Taj Mahal and make it exactly the same. They tried and you can't. Mean, TV sucks or it sucks in general. I don't 
don't like the re-recording of Mean. I'm definitely in a place in my life where like the original song has very little meaning to me. I think it's kind of a silly song. I don't think that it particularly benefits from having her new vocal in it. It has to have a country twang and Taylor kind of like half-heartedly attempts it on the TV and it's just... It's not for me. It's not for me. The song is not for me anymore. I think if you are under the age of 21, then this probably serves harder than anything alive. Or if you're currently being bullied, I mean, that's when I really related to the song, when I was being bullied in middle school. So again, I'm not knocking your personal connection to this song. My opinion on it as a TV and as a song in general is that we've moved beyond that. We don't need it anymore. We're done. The story of us, Hey Steven Treatment, okay? The story of us was probably a ripe candidate for the Hey Steven Treatment. And this is where the Tell Me Why Treatment comes in because Tell Me Why went really hard already, but the TV just took it to a place of legendariness that I was not able to anticipate. And I think that's exactly what happened to the story of us as well. And there is definitely a sense of humor being inflected in it too with the next chapter and the, the end. And the vocals in that last chorus are crazy. And we know from the foreword in Speak Now that Taylor underwent some serious vocal training before she even embarked upon recording this project. And that is evident in and of the original recording of this record itself. If you look at the original stolen version, Fearless and Speak Now, there's a huge leap in vocal quality. And I also think in the production quality as well, because Taylor was more involved in having a hand in the treatment from start to finish of all of these songs. So I think that it being able to be improved upon at all when it was already so good in the first place, it makes it, you know, a, a superstar. What can I say? Superstar, where are you from? How's it going? I'm so happy that you're here. Never grow up, great gown. I'm tempted to put it into the Hey Steven treatment, but it's not quite different enough. There has to be an element of like a noticeable improvement, a difference that is, you know, apparent on the first go around. I thought that Never Grow Up was like super, super faithful. Actually, because of that, I'm gonna put it in the 15 treatment because it's almost indistinguishable from the original song, which is what the 15 category to me is. When I heard 15 for the first time, I was like, wait, am I listening to the stolen version or am I listening to Taylor's version? It was so straight to the point. And I think that it's easier for her to do it with those songs that are um, more down tempo uh, and have less complicated production elements, less instruments. Never Grow Up is literally just her voice and a guitar and a backing vocal. And it is beautiful. It made me emotional all over again, which I didn't think it could do at this point. The Best Day actually had a similar impact upon me and a similar resonance with me after all of these years. So very happy that that was done well. In Enchanted. Enchanted is so hard to rank. I mean, I'm sure you saw my mental breakdown to it. That was purely because it was me listening to the, the grown-up version of Taylor that I've grown up with all these years, revisiting a version of Taylor that is so embedded into my brain and so special to me and so untouchable almost that hearing that fourth wall being broken really just kind of got me. But Enchanted and Dear John actually as well are songs that are so incredibly unique and specific and like moments of their time that they cannot be reproduced in a way that is better than the original. I just don't think that Enchanted, you, you couldn't do anything to make it better than the original. So I'm going to put it in Great Gown because I actually do love Enchanted Taylor's version. It's a different record to me. It's a different song, basically. I, I consider the stolen version and the Taylor's version of Enchanted particularly to be completely different musical numbers. I love how clearly you can hear the vocal layering in the bridge, the please don't be in love with someone else. I mean, the vocals go crazy at the end. I was a little worried that she wasn't going to be able to hit those high notes, but she's singing. She's singing for her goddamn life. She's singing like the rent is due tomorrow and she has zero dollars left in her checking account. Better than revenge. Mm hmm. So it can't go into the Hey Steven treatment because of the lyric change. It can't go into Great Gown because it didn't have to be this way. It can't go into the 15 treatment because it is not at all similar to the original. It can't go into I Like the Beat because I like the song so much. It can't go into Should Have Stayed in the Vault because it should not have stayed in the vault. The TV sucks. It doesn't suck. And it also doesn't suck in general. So where in the world do I put Better Than Revenge? I have no clue. I think I'm going to put her in... I like the beat. I'm very tempted to put her in TV Sucks because of the lyric change. I'm going to put it in I like the beat because I'm gonna spare her the embarrassment of being put there. But what I have to say about Better Than Revenge is that, you know, I understand the impulse to change the lyric and I stand by Taylor's decision to change the lyric if she so wants. It's her work after all. It is the choice she gets to make to revise or not revise anything that she's done. I just think that the spirit of the project calls for us to be very faithful to the canon, to the historical record. And it upsets me when we make these changes and there is no kind of like 
address. There's no explanation of why we have been doing this. All of the insight that we've gotten into the re-recording process so far has been through these four words for the records. And while I love to hear directly from Taylor and the Speak Now four words certainly was full of juicy morsels, there are certain things that I would like addressed or like questions that I would have about specific production choices that she made. Girl at home, why did you do that? Why did you change the lyric in Better Than Revenge? I mean, it's pretty clear that she doesn't stand by the message of essentially slut-shaming someone for stealing her boyfriend. But the question really for me is, would it have made that much of a difference to have just kept it the way that it was? Are we Streisand affecting it a little bit by changing it? I think there wouldn't have been as many think pieces as there have been. The Atlantic is a pretty terrible one out if, that we deconstructed on the podcast if you want to go and read some nonsense. But I think that we wouldn't have had to have drawn attention to the lyric in the first place if she had just kept it the way that it was. It's like changing it almost made it more of a thing than it needed to be and changing it and then not addressing why it was changed then opened her up to like all of these kinds of like stupid pontifications and criticisms from music reviewers who frankly don't understand what they're talking about so I'm not in favor of the lyric change because I think that we should be faithful and true to, to the record and we should be embracing all of the different facets of Taylor's career, personality, songwriting journey. And this was an unsavory but true account and reflection of how she felt at the time. And I personally think that the re-recorded version sounds amazing. Otherwise, like, it goes so hard. She put her entire chest into that re-recording. Like, she's singing for her goddamn life. It sounds amazing. The different kind of, like, talk productions, that phone call effect, the uh, do you still feel like you know what you're doing because I don't think you do part is terrifying and I think that you know vengeance revenge eye for an eye she stands by all of those messages and the spirit of better than revenge has lived on on each and every album since if I really wanted to I could sit here and give you better than revenge's spiritual sister uh, as an evolution throughout her career I think our most contemporary example of this is vigilante shit that has the spirit of better than revenge it's like the constitution of the United States okay you don't have to agree with what it said but we can't be going in and changing the words <laughs> it, it's that's not how it works the nation was found upon this document you can disagree with the founding fathers but you can't go back and tell them that they said something they didn't say innocent i like the beat i mean what is there to say about innocent really sometimes i think that people just ride for songs to be fake <laughs> like or just to like to be different to be reactionary innocent is one of those songs that is just kind of like there i think it's absolutely hilarious that taylor decided to call this song her moment on speak now of compassion and empathy if you're not familiar with the lore behind this song innocent was her written response to kanye west's uh, interrupting of her at the vmas and it is a pretty condescending uh finger wagging scolding telling off by a 20 year old to a 32 year old man it is I wouldn't say full of compassion and empathy I think it was deliberately written to make herself look good to make herself look as though she was taking the high road and we know that her like her moral compass was very fixed at this time there were good and bad people heroes and villains in every story very little flexibility or like understanding of different people's perspectives and i'm not saying that kanye west deserved anything more than what he got with innocent but characterizing this as compassion and empathy is a very interesting revision of history and i guess you could call that my main issue with interrupting or like playing with the re-recordings at all is that i don't like it when we revise the historical record because i was there it's like don't don't try and tell me something happened that didn't happen don't tell me you were being compassionate and empathetic you weren't you were saying i got you i'm better than you and that's that's that on that haunted great gown or hey steven treatment i don't know it's to me like it it goes so hard but it's not quite better than the original because I think that the production elements in the first half of the song are not quite as layered and ominous and dramatic as they are in the stolen version. But again, that last minute and a half, this is where she always almost gets me because the noted vocal improvements, the maturation, the deepening, the resonance, that always comes through so clearly in that final bit where she often, you know, does the insane vocal ad libs and shows off what she actually is capable of doing. So because of that, Haunted sh should be in the Hey Steven treatment, but the beginning part of it just didn't connect with me. So I'm going to put it in Great Gown. Last Kiss. 
I'm going to put Last Last Kiss is one of my favorite Taylor Swift songs of all time, by the way, and probably my biggest disappointment in the re-recordings. I can't put it in the 15 treatment because the shaky breath is not in it. So automatically we have not gotten it right. I think it can't go into great gown either because I am not going to be returning to the Taylor's version of Last Kiss. That's simply just not happening. Uh, I like the beat. I think she's going to have to go there. Do you know how much it pains and suffers me to put Last Kiss, one of my probably top five Taylor Swift songs of all time, into I Like the Beat? It should be at Hey Steven Treatment all the time. And again, I was confused because theoretically, this is like Never Grow Up. This is like uh, The Best Day. It's one of those songs that has such straightforward production elements that it should just be good. Something that I loved was the uh, version that she released with the Speak Now Deluxe version, the recorded version of her playing it live as a surprise song. That is stellar and fantastic. And I think sometimes with songs like Last Kiss and Dear John and Enchanted, songs that have these big reputations behind them that fans are so obsessed with and so eager to hear and so nervous about her getting it wrong, I think she gets a little nervous and she can choke. And I think she choked with Last Kiss a little bit. I think she was playing it too safe and I really like the version that she did on tour because it, yes, it's a little bit different, but I can at least hear the emotion and the passion. She's re-engaging with it in a way that I feel like she wasn't necessarily doing before. And that's why it goes into I Like the Beat. Long live. So pleased and happy to see that it was added into the Ears tour set list. And I'm so excited to be seeing it many times next year live because it is you know an emotional song one that you want to be screaming in a crowd amongst your fellow Swifties at you know the Queen herself but Long Live to me is a song that has lost its emotional resonance over the years. I went through my period of time where I wrote, I had the time of my life fighting dragons with you on my arm, with my 13 on my hand to school. I, you know, put it on the back of a ukulele that I still have. Watch me break out my ukulele and do talks at Gossip Train. But, you know, I really connected with Long Live for a long time. And I feel like I'm at the point now where I'm, I'm older. I've surpassed the cheesy corniness of it, but you know, when she plays it live at the Eras tour, suddenly I will be 14 again. So where do I put Long Live? Is it better than the original? I, you know what? The last chorus is so fucking good, but it has that girlishness that is so integral to the song itself. I'm torn between putting it in the Hey Steven treatment and Great Gown. I think I'm gonna put it in Great Gown. Is it maybe just a 15? I think that it is pretty faithful to the original. I haven't I haven't listened to it all the way through that many times, so I'm gonna put it in the 15 treatment and maybe, maybe revise that at a later date. Ours, I'm gonna put that in the 15 treatment too. There weren't any like super noticeable differences. Superman! My least favorite Taylor Swift song probably of all time should have stayed in the vault forever. Taylor's version or not, I hate that song. I want it locked up and I need it to go to jail. If it was a person, it would be on trial in my court and it would be sentenced to death. The vault tracks are kind of hard to rank, I've just realized, in all these categories I've created. So we're gonna take Hey Steven and Great Gown as like number one, amazing, and just follow up pretty good. I really like it. I like the beat is self-explanatory and then we have should have stayed in the vault. And I think that's enough categories for me to work with. So Electric Touch, I'm putting it into I like the beat. It's growing on me, that's for sure. When I first heard it, I was like, okay, I was expecting something a little bit more. I don't think the song quite lives up to its name, Electric Touch, featuring Fall Out Boy. They could have not been on it, and it probably would have been better, in my opinion. But, you know, I'm rocking with it, whatever. When Emma Falls in Love, I love this song, which is weird, because you would think that this would be a song that I wouldn't like, because it kind of does fall into that corny category, but it really wins me over in the kind of place that the narrator is coming from while she's singing these songs. It's coming from a place of heartbreak and a place of like feeling as though that love is a game that she just can't win at, but also like wistfully and hopefully looking with bright eyes towards a female role model in her life that she can see is doing it well and respecting herself and knowing her worth and her value and having that be something that Taylor like ha has been striving towards and seeing the way that that journey of finding her value plays plays out through Speak Now and Red specifically, it made me very nostalgic and emotional. So I really appreciate when Emma falls in love. I Can See You, I mean, great gown. I Can See You, to me, has been interfered with a little bit too much by Jack Antonoff. I don't believe that if you showed me the demo version of this song from 2010, it would sound the way that Jack Antonoff has made it sound. I think that it's a little modern, it's a little contemporary, it's a little too far away from anything else on the record, but it bangs. 
It bangs. It's really good. It doesn't strike me as a Speak Now song, though, which makes me suspicious of it. So I'm going to put it in Great Gown because it is a sleigh. I still haven't seen the video, by the way. I am going to be reacting to it, and that will be up on the Patreon, as well as my full reaction to Speak Now. Part two of that is coming next week. I need to see the video and decide for myself how I feel about it in, in its entirety, in all of its lore. Castle's Crumbling. What a disappointment. What a disappointment. I'm going to put it in I Like the Beat. I'm not going to say that it should have stayed in the vault because I'm glad to have it. And I think it does give us that interesting glimpse into Taylor's anxiety, her frenetic like worry brain. That is something that, you know, is just a feature of her personality that I think has stayed with her even as she's grown up. I don't think that it's that good, unfortunately. The, the metaphor is a little drawn out. It's a little heavy handed, ham fisted. It's not my favorite thing in the world. Foolish one. Hey, Steven Treatment, I love Foolish One. Foolish One might be my favorite Bolt track of all time. It just gives me that instant recall of an old Taylor that I don't have access to anymore. It follows that classic formula of like Taylor delivering a word of wisdom to herself, being the older sister that she needed in a particular moment while not being too far away from that moment, which makes it kind of funny and silly. And I just think that the way that it's sung is so beautiful. And I think the opening line has a lot to say about the record. And that is going to be expanded upon when I get into my reorganization track list. Timeless should have stayed in the vault. I'm just kidding. Should, Timeless has its purpose on the record. So I'm going to put it sucks because it does suck. Even if you like this song, it's like message in a bottle. Even if you love this, you have to just admit that it's bad. Like it's, it's bad writing. It's not very good. It's not her best work with the metaphor. This was definitely written before the bulk of the album was completed because the quality and the caliber of songwriting on this is... It's like, it's too, too much rose colored glasses. It's too newly in love. It has no perspective on the situation that she's talking about. And people kept telling me that it's about her grandparents. And I hate to break it to you, but like, just because a song is inspired by some sort of nice real life story doesn't change my opinion of whether or not it is a successful song or a good piece of writing. The writing on this is frankly embarrassing. The metaphor is heavy handed. And you know what? Taylor herself would admit this because she kept it off the album to begin with in the first place. There's a reason why it's not there. So this is what we're working with. In the Hey Steven treatment, the songs that really are like true superstars, I'm very surprised by this selection. We have Mine, Speak Now, The Song, The Story of Us, and Foolish One. In Great Gowns, we have Dear John, Legend, Enchanted, Haunted, When Emma Falls in Love, and I Can See You. In the 15 treatment, we have Never Grow Up, Long Live, and Ours. In I Like the Beat, we have Sparks Fly, Back to December, Better Than Revenge, Innocent, Last Kiss, Electric Touch, and Castles Crumbling. Wow, I Like the Beat, the neutral category being the largest and most populated. That's kind of a slay. TV sucks or it sucks in general, mean and timeless and should have stayed in the vault Superman. This is pretty on brand for the Swiftologist, I have to say. What did you guys expect? Nothing less than this, I assume. Now let's get into my reordered track list. If you're not familiar with my track list reshuffles, basically what I try and do is create a more cohesive narrative and a more pleasurable listening experience out of what I think are the most essential songs from a record. And this is always a more interesting task to do when I am working with a Taylor's version because we have a lot of excess material that can either be incorporated into the record or struck from it entirely. And some of the omissions on this record may shock you, may seem a little confusing to what I've put together, but I want you to look at this as, you know, a Swiftologist version of Speak Now. You can listen to the normal one if you want to, but this is how I probably, if I was going to restructure and reorganize it as one, sit down, listen all the way through and try and go through some sort of emotional journey. This is how I would do it. So Speak Now is kind of a difficult album to do this with because there are so many kind of different moments, emotions, and feelings that are sometimes in contrast or in conflict with one another. For example, you know, we have the grace and the forgiveness and the acceptance of last kiss and innocent, if, you know, if we're going by Taylor's words. And then we have the, you know, feral attack of better than revenge. How do we reconcile having those songs on one record, on one track list? I have tried to organize it in a way so that that kind of makes sense. And what I realized and have really appreciated and understood about Speak Now, a on the you know re-recorded version is that it kind of goes hard it goes hard and also it is very upsetting and that is very similar to red and i actually have a red ranking and reshuffling coming very soon that has been edited and ready to go for a long time but you know there have been a lot of taylor swift emergencies in the meantime so i just haven't had the chance to upload it yet and i wanted to do speak now first because i felt like it was a little bit more of a challenge 
Actually, that's a lie. Red was a lot more of a challenge. So I've whittled down Speak Now, the Swiftologist version, to 16 songs. There's 22 on Taylor's versions. And I have changed one of the bookends, which is something that I usually don't do. And the bookends are like the beginning and the end of a record. And I try not to touch them if they're good or if they make sense. And it upset me because the first bookend that I had to change was mine being the opening track of Speak Now. And don't worry about mine because mine is coming around. It is still on the track list. But I decided that I was going to open Speak Now, if I was reorganizing it and doing it again to tell a cohesive story, I was going to open it with Foolish One. Because Foolish One to me is really like the thesis and the mission statement of Speak Now. That first line says it all so clearly. My cards are on the table, yours are in your hand. And it's that very kind of like juvenile, whimsical, young and romantic approach to meeting a new person that you don't know whether you should trust or should not trust. And you're not quite old enough with enough years of experience behind you to understand or be able to filter through the people that you should give everything to when you meet them the first time and the people with whom you should hold back a little bit of your peace or your energy to protect yourself. And I think that that impulse of to put everything out on the table and open herself up completely vulnerable to be hurt and to fall in love and to have these experiences, that is what animates Speak Now and that's where all of the hurt and all of the love and all of the anguish comes from on this record. So I start with that idea of her putting everything on the table. That is my bookend. So that's the first track. The second track is another vault track. It's electric touch. And can you believe that I put that onto this record? I tried to keep as many upbeat moments on this record as I could because I feel like what's really fun about Speak Now is the diversity in tempo and pace. And the tricky thing about that is, is just trying to get it all in a format that makes sense. So from Foolish One, we go straight into electric touch because Foolish One is kind of the thesis statement. It's like, Taylor telling herself in hindsight a little bit like State of Grace, you know, which is a perfect opening to, to Red. Love is a ruthless game unless you play it good and right. And she enters into the game right after Foolish One, okay? So she goes into it, and Electric Touch is about that first glance feeling, the first time you meet someone, you know, wondering if it's going to break your heart or bring you back to life. That's kind of the position that she's in, and it doesn't matter whether it's going to break her heart or bring her back to life. She's going to enter into this situation, this scenario, with optimism anyway, because it is this Electric Touch. And after Electric Touch, track three, we go straight into Sparks Fly, because Sparks Fly is the older, badder, better sister. You know, she says everything that Electric Touch says, but in a more sophisticated way and kind of in a more dramatic way. You know, the way you move is like a full-on rainstorm and I'm a house of cards. What we're getting in this first part of the record is the sense of surrender and giving up. And I don't want to say submission, I don't want to say submission because that's not the right word, but it's like this willing um, giving over of oneself to the process of falling in love. And I think that those three songs really explain that very beautifully. And then we get into track four. Track four is always a tricky one because the first three songs that I have on Speak Now are kind of, they are whimsical, they are a little bit hopeful, but in each of those songs, there is a touch of danger. In Foolish One, it's that warning that the older Taylor gives to this younger version of Taylor. In Electric Touch, it's that awareness that this situation could break her heart. And in Sparks Fly, it's, you know, I'm on my guard from the rest of the world, but for you, I know it's no good. I can't help it. I just have to fall in love. And we go into a moment where I think we have to skip forward a little bit and where we kind of see the natural consequence of that ending. So after Sparks Fly, we go into the story of us. And the story of us is really, there's still a little bit of hope in that scenario. You know, there is this idea that maybe things could come back together. You know, I liked it better when you were on my side. I would lay my armor down if you say you'd rather love than fight. There's still a little bit of like that naivety there in track four, the story of us. And of course, that naivety is kind of pretty much smacked out of her by the time we get to track five. Track five is historically the most emotional center point, the heartbeat of any album. And how could I take Dear John out of the track five position? I couldn't. It has to be there forever. It's the ultimate track five. It's really where we started to realize that track fives were even a thing to begin with. So canonically, I have to respect it and put it there. I have Dear John there because, you know, the story of us and Dear John are about the same man, essentially. And I think I've put them actually in their sequential order. So the story of us is kind of like the break down of that relationship, the hope that it may still come back together. And Dear John is the realization that she has been taken advantage of, that she has been manipulated, that she has been placed into a position that she didn't want to be in and that she didn't know she didn't want to be in until she found herself in it. And 
I have to keep Dear John exactly where it is. Up next, I have track six, which is better than revenge. Because what we get at the end of Dear John is an anger, is a righteous anger. You know, I'm shining like fireworks over your sad, empty town. It is a bit of a smugness. And that is the energy that we go straight into with Better Than Revenge. Because I think we're in a little bit of an angry part of the album, right? So this three track run that I have coming up from track five is definitely the more kind of like, I simply must be avenged for the things that have happened to me and what I've experienced. So we have Dear John, which, you know, is desperation that turns into righteous anger. Track six at Better Than Revenge, which is that full expression of that anger, letting it, redirecting it, targeting it at different places. A lot of the times when you fall in love, you want to be angry at someone. And it's hard to be angry at the person who you are still so in love with, even though you're upset. So you lash out at other people. Uh, that's exactly what's happening in Better Than Revenge. Misguided anger. Track seven after Better Than Revenge is Haunted, because I think that Haunted definitely has that anger too, but also that realization that like, oh shit, I'm like fully in it now and I don't know how I'm ever going to be able to move on from this again. And Haunted says all of that in a very dramatic way. So I think that that three track run, Dear John, Better Than Revenge and Haunted is pretty like knock you off your feet. And I really like the pacing of those songs when I listen to them together. And then I think, you know, Speak Now actually ends up being a lot more hopeful than you think it is. It seems like it is this like desperate breakup album, but this is definitely her most romantic and lovable album. It is mostly about romance. All the pitfalls, you know, how it's all red, you know, it's gray, it's blue, it's red, it's everything. All shades of love are included on this record. So after Haunted, I have track eight, which is when Emma falls in love. And when Emma falls in love earlier, as I said, when you listen to it closely, it's not just a sweet little ditty about really looking up to her friend Emma. It's also a wounded person looking at someone who is making good decisions when it comes to love and hoping and wishing that you can emulate that. And I think that line of when Emma falls in love, I'm learning is really important here. You know, after Haunted, she's like, I can't, I don't know where to go. I'm completely just like stalked by this, this person, this relationship that I can't get out of my head. And when Emma falls in love, kind of is a little bit like Begin Again on Red. It's that signal of a starting over, of a re-engaging. And track nine, after When Emma Falls in Love, is Enchanted. Enchanted is one of those songs that comes from someone who is young enough not to realize that love at first sight is not really a thing. It's kind of a myth. And what I love about Enchanted is that it's actually really not about the person she's speaking to, thank God, because it's Adam Young from Owl City. It's really about Taylor's worldview and approach and attitude when it comes to love. And that is totally ridiculous. And I think there's something so endearing and so sweet about that. And I think that Enchanted coming after when Emma falls in love is her choosing to be hopeful again, opening herself up to being hurt again because she wants to be in love. She wants to know what it feels like to experience and have a real romance. So after Enchanted at track nine, I have track 10, which is, and you're gonna be gagged, many of you are gonna be gagged, Timeless. So from Enchanted onward, we are really entering a more lovey-dovey, happy, back straight into the swing of romance again kind of moment. And Timeless is a similarly delusional song to Enchanted. It is clearly addressed to someone that she has not known for a very long period of time, and yet she is still insisting that their love is similar to a couple that died in the 1500s. Like it's completely over the top, silly and ridiculous, but perfectly encapsulating of that Enchanted attitude and also that speak now disposition that she had. So I had to put it there because I think that it's very classic. I don't like it. I don't really like to listen to it. But when I'm trying to tell a story here, this is a really important puzzle piece that when I took it out, I realized I really needed it there to drive the narrative onward. After Timeless, we get into another kind of delusional fabrication, uh, but that is a little bit more rooted in reality. It's mine, Taylor's version. So isn't this just the most delicious run ever? When Emma Falls in Love, Enchanted, Timeless, and Mine. There's a lot of corniness going on here. There's a lot of syrupy sweetness. But again, I think that that is something that is so part and parcel with this edition and this version of Taylor and her life. So after mine, we have ours, because so cute to have those together, right? I mean, I couldn't resist. And mine and ours are kind of more about like actual relationships rather than the feeling of falling in love or the feeling of loving someone. They are more like, accurate reflections of real life relationships. So in mine, she's talking about like not making her parents mistakes and considering baggage that she has from her past while coming into a new relationship. And ours is really about kind of like rejecting outside forces and ignoring what people are saying about your relationship in order to keep it strong and to nurture your love and to be pure and true to your intentions, which is something that she definitely did all the way throughout this record. We're getting into the last four songs of this record and track 13 after ours is back to December. And I think, you know, this last portion of the record 
is reflective. So the first part we had was very like experiential and reactive. The middle part is kind of about like going through and living like presently in the moment and kind of trying to readjust your perspective. And this last part I think is like looking back on your mistakes while also looking forward. So it's a real maturing moment, I think, in this version of the track list. So track 13 is back to December and she's, you know, making peace with moments that maybe she didn't treat people right. Because as we know, Taylor's pen and her writing life is very much often focused at this point in her career on people that have wronged her, what's been done to her. But part of growing up and getting older and realizing what it means to be a good partner and what it means to be in a good relationship is understanding, realizing, and taking accountability for when you've been wrong or when you've hurt someone else. Because, you know, it doesn't always, it takes two to end a relationship. It's not always one person's fault. And sometimes you, in fact, are the person who's at fault. And that's exactly what Back to December is telling us. After Back to December at track 14, I have Last Kiss. Because Last Kiss is also kind of a wallowing song. It's a learning song. It's a processing song. It's a coming to the realization that sometimes, you know, even if you try being angry, better than revenge, you try being hopeful about the future, enchanted, you try being a little bit more mature and rejecting what other people think, ours, sometimes you still can't shake off the feeling that something that you no longer have anymore is something that you would really want. And even though you want it back, you have absolutely no idea how to go about bringing that back into your life. And you come to the conclusion eventually that sometimes there is a last kiss. 15, we have never grow up. I think never grow up is a really important growing up and pensive moment on this record that I wanted to put towards the end of the record, especially after a song like Last Kiss, because it is about treasuring the aspects of your life that are not romantic. Romantic. It's about not being boy crazy or like boy obsessed. It's about understanding that everything in life is temporal and fleeting and that, you know, everything I have is someday going to be gone. Learning how to uh, stand on your own two feet and be a grown up and live for yourself and make choices that feel good for you. I think Never Grow Up is a beautiful depiction of the transition between being an adolescent and a young adult. And we conclude the album with track 16 at Long Live. How could I get rid of Long Live? Long Live is a letter and a missive to the fans. It is a beautiful kiss off. It was designed to be a closing number and I just couldn't take it out of this experience. Again, it reflects that whimsical and romantic side of Taylor while also acknowledging that there is struggle and hardship to get to wherever it is that you wanna go. No battle worth fighting is easily won. And that is my version of Speak Now. What have I left off? I've left off mean. I just don't see a place for it. I suppose it could come after Better Than Revenge, but I just didn't feel like having the album be that long. I try and keep these albums as concise as possible when I do my reshuffle because I want it to be a sit down listen all the way through. Speak Now, the song is not on it. And that's just because I couldn't find a moment for it to be there. I think like the thesis statement of the album is much more clearly stated and foolish one. Speak Now is kind of a folklore song or like a merry song or like a timeless even and that it's kind of like a fictional extrapolation. Castles Crumbling, I didn't think that added anything to this record. I'm sorry. And I can see you also. This is on Spotify as are all my track list reshuffles. I also have my July playlist of music that's not Taylor that I listen to. If you want to go and listen to that as well. Let me know what you think of it. Do you like this flow? Would you change it? Where would you put your favorite songs? Are there any songs that you are like very adamant that should be on it that I've left off? How do you feel about the bookends? What do you think about the re-recordings in general? Were they fun to you? Were they good? Was Speak Now the best one yet? The correct answer to that is yes. If you're ever wondering where to find me, I'm on Instagram. I'm there a lot. And also I'm on Discord. Swiftologist Discord where the evolution of snakeheads get together and kiki all day long is so fun. It is really very fun. So if you would like to be a member of that, you can join for as low as $3 a month and you can get a link to that through the Patreon. So all that is linked below. And I am so excited to be back in my home environment and creating more thoughtful pop culture for you. Congratulations on surviving release week. We did it Swifties, we did it. And I will see you all at the Eras tour or you know, before that in another video, but goodbye Swifties.